Have you ever heard of something called diffuse axonal injury? It's commonly seen in trauma and is one of the most severe types of traumatic brain injury. Yesterday I presented the case of a 35-year-old man who presented to the emergency department as a level trauma after a motorcycle accident. He was protected. He was in a full face helmet, all of his gear, and a car pulled out in front of him. Bystanders at the scene said he swerved to miss the vehicle and ran off the road. When paramedics arrived on the scene, he was a GCS of six. And when he came into the emergency department, his scans were pretty unrevealing. He suffered what's called diffuse axonal injury. So let's talk about what that diagnosis is and what the prognosis is. Think of the brain as like the motherboard to your whole body. All the neurons in your brain are interconnected in pathways with your entire body. So if you're involved in a trauma with sudden acceleration or deceleration momentum of your head, those axons or connections can get sheared or stretched. And this shearing injury will disrupt the transmission of nerve impulses. So some parts of your brain can come disconnected from your body. So let's talk about the presentation, diagnosis, treatment, and potential outcomes. And I'm gonna go ahead and tell you that this diagnosis is tricky because outcomes from patient to patient can vary so drastically. That's why it's so hard for us to give a good prediction with someone with a brain injury. Because there are so many things within the brain that are variable and that we just don't know. So let's talk about what we do know. The presentation of DAI varies greatly from patient to patient. Most patients on presentation are unresponsive at the time of the accident. That can range from minutes to hours to days to even a persistent vegetative state. And you can guess it's because of how many neurons are disrupted and how severe the injury really is. So patients that are comatose usually have a severe DAI. It's important to remember that there are a lot of different things that can mimic this diagnosis. Focal brain injuries, high cervical spinal cord injuries, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy where the brain is deprived of oxygen, kind of like in cardiac arrest or drowning. Any type of encephalopathy, infection, or even severe cerebral edema can all mimic DAI. So to confirm the diagnosis, it's essential to perform a thorough evaluation. And of course, there's many tests that we also do to help make the diagnosis. The mechanism of injury is extremely important to help clue us in if the patient suffered DAI. There has to be some type of acute acceleration or deceleration type movement to shear those neurons, like a car accident, a fall, or an assault. Physical examination, including calculation of the Glasgow Coma Score. Remember, I said that patient's GCS was six, so what does that even mean? That's called the Glasgow Coma Score, which is how we calculate someone's level of consciousness. The score is from three to 15, depending on the patient's level of consciousness, and we use three factors to calculate that score. Eye opening, verbal response and motor response. A completely interactive normal human is a GCS of 15 and someone that's completely unresponsive with no eye opening, no verbal response and no motor response to pain is a GCS of three. Our patient was a GCS of six and that's because on the scene he demonstrated no verbal response, no eye opening and he withdrew to painful stimulus. The motor response is calculated depending on how the patient interacts to a painful stimulus, like pinching their skin. Normally, if someone's kind of out of it and you pinch them, they will reach up and attempt to grab you to pull them away. And that is called localizing. If they withdraw from the pain, that's a four on the GCS score. Three is decorticate posturing and two is decerebrate posturing. And both of those indicate severe neurological damage. Depending on the total cumulative score, you will have a grade of a mild, moderate, or severe TBI. Any glass calcoma score between a three and an eight is indicative of a severe traumatic brain injury and the patient needs protection of their airway. In other words, the patient has not enough neurological response to prevent aspiration and they need a breathing tube and to be hooked up to life support. All of that, including the patient's primary trauma assessment, is done in the field by the paramedics. The secondary trauma evaluation is typically done in the emergency department with a head to toe complete physical examination of the patient. After that is completed and we get a grasp of the magnitude of the patient's injuries, they then go on for more testing and imaging studies. 
Other than the head injury, our patient's secondary survey was pretty clean, though he went to get scanned. And let me point out to you what I see on this CT scan of his brain. First, we see a very tiny petechial hemorrhage here in the left frontal lobe. And although this part of the scan looks pretty good, there is also a very small petechiae right in the corpus callosum or the middle part of the brain where our brain interconnects. This right here may potentially be a small amount of subarachnoid hemorrhage. And in this cut of the CT scan, there is also a very small petechial hemorrhage in his thalamus. Thalamus is one of the deep cortical structures of the brain. These diffuse, tiny petechial hemorrhages are indicative of DAI. It's basically little signs of teeny tiny shearing of those neurons in those particular portions of the brain, which are pretty classic for DAI. In even more severe cases, we can see it in the brainstem. Once the patient is neurologically stable, an MRI of the brain can also be helpful to help identify areas of shearing. Now there are many classification and scoring systems that we utilize for aiding in this type of injury. The Marshall classification and the Rotterdam score are both CT guided scoring systems. And the Adams grade utilizes MRI imaging. Our patient's examination and imaging studies would correlate to a stage two DAI. That's because on his imaging, there was no involvement of the brainstem. And unfortunately, grade two is a very gray area in terms of prognosis and recovery expectations. Grade one is usually associated with a better ability to have a good prognosis, and a grade three is more indicative of a severe injury that may lead to severe neurological disability and death. So these grade two ones are very tricky in how we educate patients' families in making decisions for the patient. He's very young, has no other injuries, so we wanna give him every chance for a good outcome. The patient did undergo an ICP monitor, which is an intracranial pressure monitor where we measure the pressure in someone's brain. That monitor can give us a good idea on if there is any swelling in the head that needs to be treated. After a week in the hospital, he had no problems with his pressure, but remained to be in a comatose state and underwent a tracheotomy and a feeding tube placement. That's so we can continue to sustain the patient's life while his brain is healing from this injury. Now here's the really tricky part about the brain, is that patients that are in vegetative states or in comas can still breathe because that part of their brain is still functioning. They can even start to begin to open their eyes spontaneously and have normal sleep and wake cycles, despite cognitively not being there at all. That means that their brainstem is still working, but those higher cortical features no longer are working. This is very hard on patients' families. And these are extremely tough decisions that have to be made. After several weeks in the hospital, he was slowly weaned off the ventilator and was transferred to a long-term care facility. After many, many months, he did regain some purposeful movement, but still remains to be fed by a feeding tube. He remains wheelchair bound and total care. And this is the hard thing about traumatic brain injury is that not all outcomes are what we want. This quality of life may be acceptable for one person and not acceptable for the next. That's why it's so important that you relay any information on what you would want if you were in this condition to a family member or someone that would be making medical decisions if you were incapacitated. Even better, have it put in a legal document like an advanced directive, no matter how old you are because life can change in an instant. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Stay tuned next week and we'll go through another case.